Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. In the 1940s, Texarkana was a railroad hub that straddled the Texas and Arkansas state lines. Industry in the area was thriving because of the natural resources in the area like timber, agriculture, and mineral deposits. At the beginning of World War II, the Red River Army Depot and the Lone Star Army Ammunition Plant was built for a cool $45.5 million and supplied artillery shells, bombs, fuses, and other items for the war. Life was good. Business was booming, the population was growing, and Texarkana was one of the major railroad centers in the Southwest. Life in Texarkana changed abruptly in 1946 when three people were brutally attacked and five were murdered between February and May of that year. Over 400 suspects were questioned and hundreds of leads were followed, but we still don't have a definitive answer of who the culprit was 77 years later. I'm Amber. And I'm Gina. And this is the weird true story of the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. James Jimmy Hollis was a 25-year-old insurance agent when he began dating 19-year-old Mary Jean Larry, who lived with her parents in Hooks, Texas, about 20 minutes outside of Texarkana. On the evening of February 22, 1946, the couple went to the movies and were returning to Mary Jean's house when they took a detour and parked on a secluded, unpaved lane about 100 yards from the last row of houses in a new neighborhood. In an interview with the Texarkana Gazette a few months later, Mary Jean stated that they had been there about 10 minutes when a man wearing a white mask over his head with cutout places for his eyes and mouth walked up to the car. He pointed a flashlight and pistol at them and told Jimmy something along the lines of, I don't want to kill you, fellow, so do what I say. They both exited the car on the driver's side and stood next to the masked man. The man told Jimmy to take off your expletive here, britches, and Mary Jean told Jimmy to take them off so they wouldn't be hurt. After Jimmy took off his pants, the man hit him twice in the head. Mary Jean thought he had been shot because it was so loud, but later learned it was the sound of his skull cracking. Ugh, ouch. Ow pain. Yeah. After Jimmy was unconscious, the attacker turned to Mary Jean and demanded money. She took Jimmy's wallet from his pockets and showed the man there was no cash, but he didn't believe her. He then hit her with what she believed to be a piece of iron pipe and knocked her to the ground but she managed to get back up. The man told her to run, so she ran toward a parked car on Richmond Road. She ran up to the car hoping someone was inside, but there wasn't anyone there. She started running again, but her heels made it difficult and the attacker caught up to her. He then hit her again and knocked her to the ground. At this point, he began assaulting her. Mary Jean stated that the man didn't rape her, but abused her terribly. Police reports would later indicate that the suspect used the gun barrel to sexually assault her. Jimmy regained consciousness, got up, and headed toward Richmond Road where he stopped a passing car. The suspect took off, probably frightened by the lights from the car. Mary Jean, afraid she was still being chased, continued to run for what she guessed to be around a half mile until she reached a house for help. Jimmy Hollis spent more than 12 days recovering from his injuries at Texarkana Hospital. He suffered physically and mentally for a long time following the events of that night. Neither he nor Mary Jean could describe their attacker and were understandably concerned he would come back to finish what he started. Jimmy said that the man who beat him so unmercifully was a sadist and crazy. He even warned police at the time that the man was desperate and would kill the next couple he attacked. By April, 
Mary Jean had already left Texarkana to live in Frederick, Oklahoma, because she couldn't bear to stay in town. In an interview in May of 1946, Jimmy said he was also thinking of leaving Texarkana for a job in Shreveport. Jimmy and Mary Jean were both sure that the man who attacked them was responsible for the murders that took place just months later. I can wholeheartedly say that I agree with that assumption. The attack on Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry didn't make headlines or travel through gossip circles in town. It would be quite some time before the people of Texarkana started to worry about their safety, which is a shame because if they had, maybe we wouldn't be talking about this next couple. On the morning of March 24, 1946, 29-year-old Richard Lanier Griffin and 17-year-old Polly Ann Moore were found shot to death in Richard's 1941 Oldsmobile on a secluded street known as Lover's Lane. Of course, of course that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. The couple was last seen around 10 p.m. on March 23rd in a cafe on West 7th Street, where they ate dinner with Richard's sister, Eleanor. They had only been dating for about six weeks. It's hard to find information about the victims in some of these older cases, but here's what we learned about Richard and Polly Ann. Richard Lanier Griffin was born on August 31, 1916, to parents Richard Hightower Griffin and Bernice Griffin. He had just received his discharge from the U.S. Navy Seabees, its construction battalion, in November 1945. He was living with his mother in a home built for servicemen returning from World War II. Griffin was a carpenter and painter and managed his own business. Polly Ann Moore was born on November 10, 1929, to George Sloan Moore and Lizzie May Moore. She graduated from Atlanta High School in Douglasville, Texas, in May of 1945. She then moved to Texarkana and began working at the Red River Arsenal and lived in a boarding house. She was wearing her high school class ring at the time of her death, which her younger brother Mark wore until he went to East Texas State University. At the scene of the crime, it was noted that Richard and Polly Ann had each been shot in the back of the head at least once. Richard was on his knees between the two front seats with his head resting in his hands. His pants pockets had been turned inside out, indicating that the attacker attempted to rob him after he shot him. According to a police report written by Arkansas State Police Trooper Max Tackett, Polly Ann was found face down in the rear seat of the car. But it appeared that she had been killed outside of the car on a blanket and then placed back in the vehicle. Very few clues were found at the scene of the crime. There were bullets found that matched a 32 caliber pistol that investigators believed to be a Colt model, but no gun was found. There was a section of ground saturated with dry blood about 20 feet from the car. A blood-stained portion of soil was sent to the crime lab in Austin for analysis, but it more than likely belonged to Polly Ann. Investigators did find a picture of Polly Ann inside her purse, which was found beside her body in the car. Unfortunately, it rained most of the day on Sunday, washing away any potential footprints that could have been left behind. Within three days of the murders, the sheriff's office had already questioned about 50 to 60 people and traced down more than 100 false leads. Investigators believed Richard and Polly Ann's murders were an isolated incident and not related to the February attacks on Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry. This is interesting considering both couples were parked in a secluded area and a gun was used in both attacks. The general public in Texarkana still didn't seem too concerned about the recent happenings in town. If investigators believed it was an isolated incident, then there was no reason to worry, right? Well, that consensus changed pretty quickly after the events that took place just three weeks later, on April 14th of 1946. Paul Martin was only 17 years old and the youngest of four boys. He was born on May 8th of 1929 to Reuben S. Martin Sr. and Inez Donnelly. His father, Reuben, owned an ice business and had moved it to Kilgore, an East Texas oil town, in 1944. 
Inez, his mother, preferred Texarkana and convinced Reuben to continue living there and commute to Kilgore for work. Paul was a student of the Gulf Coast Military Academy at Gulfport, Mississippi for a time before going back to Texarkana. Betty Jo Booker was born on June 5, 1930, to William Blanton Booker and Bessie Lou Tennell. Her father, William, died at the age of 31, and her mother got remarried to a man named Clark Brown. She started dancing at an early age and was featured at civic club luncheons and similar events. In high school, she began singing and playing the saxophone and wanted to be a medical technician. She was only 15 years old at the time of her murder. On the night of April 13th, Betty Jo had been recruited to play the saxophone at the Veterans of Foreign Wars Club. After the event, around 1.30 a.m., Betty Jo was leaving when she ran into Paul Martin in the parking lot, and he offered to give her a ride. Their original destination was a slumber party across town, but they stopped at a downtown cafe around 2 a.m. This is the last time they were seen alive. Around 6 a.m. on the morning of April 14, 1946, Paul Martin's body was found lying against a hedge of honeysuckle flowers. He had been shot four times, once in his right hand, once in his face, once in the back of his neck, and once again in the back. Betty Jo was found six hours later on the side of the road, about a mile away from where Paul was found. She was fully clothed, face up, with one gunshot in her chest and one on the left side of her face. During the autopsy, a vaginal swab was done and tested positive for semen, but it wasn't Paul's. The official report states that Betty Jo was raped. Remember, Mary Jean Larry, who survived the first attack, had been sexually assaulted. Paul's car, a 1946 Ford Club Coupe, with the key still in the ignition, was located another mile away headed in a different direction. No gun was found. The pistol used in the double murder was believed to be a 32 caliber Colt pistol, same as the weapon used three weeks prior. A latent fingerprint was found on the car's steering wheel, but forensic testing showed that it didn't belong to Paul or Betty Jo. The public started taking things a little more seriously after news of the second double murder in three weeks made its way around town. Residents gathered a reward pool totaling $700, which is a little over $11,000 today, for information that led to catching the suspect. Local, city, and state police from Texas and Arkansas, along with the FBI, quickly became involved in the investigation once they determined they had a serial murderer on their hands. According to an article in the San Angelo Standard Times from May 11, 1946, some members of the younger generation in Texarkana were going too far in trying to catch the murderer, who had been dubbed the Phantom Killer. The sheriff and chief of police had put out a public statement telling citizens that somebody was out of pocket during the Booker-Martin murder and urged people to remember if anyone they knew was missing on those dates. This call to action caused some residents to begin trailing people they believed to be suspicious. A high school athlete had the tires of his vehicle shot by police after he refused to stop following a bus that had been boarded by a man who seemed suspicious. Some of the younger folk were going so far as to arm themselves and park on dark country roads to wait for the Phantom to try another attack. I don't think this is what the police had in mind when they said to keep an eye out. I'm thinking not. No. On May 3rd, 1946, three weeks after the murders of Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker, 37-year-old Virgil Starks was sitting in his armchair in his living room reading the newspaper and listening to the radio in his farmhouse. Virgil and his wife, Katie, lived off of U.S. Highway 67, about 10 miles northeast of Texarkana on the Arkansas side. While he was reading the paper, an unidentified gunman fired two shots from a three-foot distance through the closed front porch window, striking him in the back of the head. Virgil's wife, Katie, was in her bedroom at the time of the shooting. She entered the living room where she found Virgil slumped over in the chair, bleeding. 
She ran to a wall-mounted telephone to call for help, but before she could finish dialing, a gunshot struck her in the right cheek, and then another struck her in the jaw below her lower lip. The impact broke several teeth. Though severely injured, Katie dropped to the floor and crawled to the bedroom to avoid the line of fire. The gunman had run around to their back porch in an attempt to break through the kitchen window. Meanwhile, Katie is struggling to her feet and trying to find a safe way out of the house. She headed to the kitchen, but heard the killer attempting to break the window. Bleeding severely, she made her way back to the bedroom, then through the living room and out the front door, trailing blood the whole way. Katie ran to her sister's house on the other side of the highway, only to find she wasn't home. So she kept running. 50 more yards down the road to the A.V. Prater farmhouse. There, she finally found help and got a ride to the hospital. The bullet that struck Katie's right cheek exited behind her left ear, but the bullet that had hit her lower jaw was lodged under her tongue. Katie survived the attack, but unfortunately never saw the killer's face. The attack immediately attracted somewhere between 20 and 30 local, county, state, and federal law enforcement officers. This was the third shooting in six weeks and the fourth since February. When investigators went to people's homes in the area to question them, the residents would stand near the front of their homes and yell at law enforcement to identify themselves before getting too close or for fear of getting shot. I, I can't really say I blame them for being so cautious. Mm -mm. Back in the Starks' home, investigators found the living room filled with smoke from a shorted-out heating pad burning in Virgil Stark's chair, where he still sat slumped over. After breaking in, the killer tracked bloody footprints through the living room before leaving through the front door and across the highway. Canine units followed the suspect's trail on the highway for about 200 yards, before crossing back to the other side of the highway and losing it about a half mile later. Police found two small bullet holes shot through the front porch window, leading them to believe the attacker used either an automatic or semi-automatic weapon. The bullets extracted from Stark's body were fired from a 22 caliber semi-automatic weapon, possibly a rifle. A spent shell casing was found on the front porch and taken as evidence. A rare type of flashlight, apparently belonging to the gunman, was also found. Miller County Sheriff Davis said he couldn't link the Starks' murder with the double slayings because of the differences in gun calibers. While there were investigators who did believe the attacks were connected, the lead investigator on the case, Tillman Johnson, felt like the phantom killer wasn't responsible for the Starks' murder. The first three couples were young and in cars, but the Starks couple were at home, married, and in their mid to late 30s. While the circumstances around the shooting didn't entirely match the prior two murders and aggravated assault of Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry, police went ahead and included the Starks murder in their investigation. After the murder of Virgil Starks and the attempted murder of Katie Starks, Residents believed another killing would happen in three weeks. But the weekend of May 24, 1946, came and went without incident. Arkansas State Police troopers were pulled from other areas in the state to patrol Texarkana for about 30 days following the Spring Lake Park murders of Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker. Milton Mossier, an Arkansas police trooper, told the Texarkana Gazette in a 1996 interview that they had to check on absolutely anything that seemed suspicious, and people had lights on everywhere. Phone lines were swamped with calls from Corsicana on the night of May 10th when a rumor spread that the killer was in the vicinity. But the Corsicana sheriff and police chief quickly shut down these rumors. Denison and Sherman also reported scares. Denison police received a call that a strange red-haired man was seen fitting the description of the phantom near Lufkin, who boasted that he was the Texarkana suspect. Most of the calls and so-called sightings of the Phantom didn't amount to much in the days following the fifth murder, but there were other possibly related incidents and one lead that seemed pretty solid, initially. 
Earl Cliff McSpadden was found mutilated on the Kansas City Southern Railroad tracks 16 miles north of Texarkana around 6 a.m. on May 7th of 1946. He was identified from his social security card. The coroner's report stated that he was dead before being placed on the tracks. He had been run over by a train, but there were no bruises on him like what would have occurred if he had fallen under the train and then been hit. There was a deep cut above McSpadden's eye that was serious enough to cause death. His body was discovered while officers were searching the area for the person who shot Virgil Starks and his wife. There is a rumor that McSpadden was the phantom killer and committed suicide by jumping in front of the train, but this seems highly unlikely, and we'll get into why in just a bit. There was also another incident that took place soon after the Starks' murder. A woman living on a farm about 11 miles east of Caddo, Oklahoma, was attacked around May 10, 1946, by a man who claimed he killed three women in Texarkana. The report made by the sheriff's office stated that the man cut off the woman's hair and threatened to kill her. He was reportedly frightened from the farmhouse by a passing herd of horses. Later, the man, Charles Coleman, was found and held for questioning in Atoka, Oklahoma, but was eliminated as a suspect in the Texarkana killings after establishing alibis at the time of the murders. Charles Coleman may not have been the phantom killer, but there were plenty of other people who had no problem confessing to the murders. Nine people, to be exact. Unfortunately, none of their statements lined up with the facts, and they were let go. Max Tackett, the Arkansas police trooper, was busy investigating car thefts when he realized that on the night of the Griffin Moore murders, a car had been stolen in the area and a different stolen car had been found abandoned. Police tracked down one of the stolen cars, abandoned in a downtown parking lot on June 28th of 1946. A stakeout of the area led to the arrest of a 21-year-old woman named Peggy Swinney. Her new husband, 29-year-old Yule Lee Swinney, became their new prime suspect. Yule Swinney already had an extensive criminal record that included burglary, counterfeiting, car theft, robbery and assault, and attempting to sell a stolen car in Atlanta, Texas, around the same time the car was found in the parking lot. Atlanta police followed Swinney out of town as he drove north toward Texarkana, where local police were looking for him. Tackett arrested Yule inside the Arkansas Motor Coach bus station in downtown Texarkana. After being placed in the police car, Swinney said to Tackett, Hell, I know that you want me for more than just stealing cars. While under arrest, Peggy Swinney gave several detailed descriptions and statements to police about the Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin murders. She rode with police to the site where Paul Martin was murdered and described how her husband, then boyfriend, shot the couple. She shared details only a person at the scene of the crime would know. One detail that directly connected Peggy and Yule Swinney to the crime was Peggy's statement about Paul Martin's date book being thrown into some nearby bushes. This book was found by Bowie County Sheriff Bill Presley and not known by the general public. Peggy Swinney made four other statements to law enforcement about the Booker Martin murders. In each statement, she said she was with her then boyfriend, Yule Swinney, on the morning of April 14, 1946 when Booker and Martin were found shot to death at different locations near Spring Lake Park. However, while her description of Yule Swinney's actions that morning remained the same in each retelling, her level of involvement changed. In a copy of the police interrogation of Peggy on July 23rd of 1946, she told law enforcement that she and Swinney were at her sister's house discussing the murders in Texarkana when she asked him who killed the couple, which is weird in itself because if he wasn't involved, how would he know who killed them? But anyway, Swinney told Peggy it was someone with a brilliant mind, someone with more sense than the cops. Okay. 
In her second statement, Peggy said that on the night of April 13th, she and Swinney drove to Texarkana from Dallas and stopped for a steak dinner around 6.30 p.m. After dinner, they saw a movie at the Joy Theater, drank a couple of beers at the Driver's Cafe, and took four bottles with them to Spring Lake Park, where they parked near a dairy. Swinney then left the car to take a leak and was gone for about an hour when Peggy heard what sounded like two gunshots. The sun was coming up when Swinney got back to the car, his clothes soaked up to his knees. Her story changed again in her third statement when she told the police that Swinney said he was going out to the park to rob someone on the evening of April 13th. Peggy's fourth statement, however, changed quite drastically and provided a lot more detail. This time, she said she got out of the 1941 Plymouth with Swinney and walked up to the driver's side of Paul Martin's car and told the couple to get out. Swinney then told the couple to give them everything they had while pointing his gun at Paul Martin. According to Peggy, both she and Betty Jo Booker were screaming and begging Swinney not to shoot anyone. Swinney told Peggy to search the couple for money, but she refused. He got mad and shot Paul Martin twice with a 32 caliber handgun. Both women were forced into Swinney's car, and he drove westward on North Park Road for a short distance before doubling back to the scene. Paul Martin had managed to get up and move from where he had first been shot, so Swinney shot him two more times. All of this was new information that she hadn't shared in previous statements. Swinney then drove westward again before turning onto Morris Lane. According to Peggy, he then ordered Betty Jo Booker out of the car and walked with her into a wooded area off the lane, where he eventually shot her. He returned later without Booker and told Peggy he tried to get some from the girl, but she refused, so he shot her. Oh, yeah. Swinney was under arrest for vehicle theft, but wouldn't talk about anything related to the murders. When asked about his wife, Peggy, he clammed up and said nothing. He was taken to Little Rock, Arkansas, where he was given a shot of sodium pentothal, or truth serum, but they gave him too much and he passed out without saying a word. Okay, time for a learning moment. According to sunrisehouse.com, weird name, but I swear it checked out. Sodium pentothal slows the rate of communication between the brain and the central nervous system. It depresses the body's ability to transmit information to and from the brain, making it useful for pain relief. At the beginning of the 20th century, drugs like these were used during childbirth for said pain relief, and a doctor by the name of Robert House noticed that when on the drug, women were quick to respond unthinkingly to questions. He figured that if it can calm the mind of a woman having a baby, surely it can get potential spies and criminals to tell the truth. This became a very popular method for getting the truth out of criminals. And while it might be a mind-altering drug, the effect isn't strong enough to stop a person from lying, and courts were generally wary of confessions from suspects under the influence of truth serum. The more you know. And it also just makes me think of uh, truth serum in Harry Potter. So there's that. (laughs) You would go there. (laughs) I would, yes. Peggy Swinney refused to testify in court at her husband's trial in 1947 and couldn't be compelled to do so under the law. She married Yul Swinney mere hours before she had been taken into police custody in June of 1946. Peggy was jailed for being an accessory to car theft. Swinney was extradited to Bowie County and received a life sentence in state prison on the auto theft charge and a conviction for being a habitual criminal. However, his conviction was overturned and he was released on parole in 1973 when the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ruled that he was not adequately represented by an attorney during his initial arraignment for the 1946 car theft charge. He died in a Dallas nursing home on September 15, 1994. Two of the lead investigators, Max Tackett and Tillman Johnson, continued to believe he was guilty of the murders until their own deaths. Michael Newton, the author of the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, 
also points to Yul Swinney as the phantom killer. But there are a couple of other suspects that are often mentioned when discussing the Texarkana murders. According to part one of the released FBI records, Ralph Bauman was taken into custody in Los Angeles on May 23rd of 1946 after confessing to the murders. He claimed that on the day of the Stark murder, he woke up after a fugue state and noticed that his rifle was gone. A fugue state is a period of loss of awareness of one's identity, often paired with flight from one's usual environment. These behaviors are often associated with certain forms of hysteria or epilepsy. Bauman heard about a suspect who matched his description. Young adult male, red hair, freckled face, 5'8 and 150 pounds, and decided to hitchhike to Los Angeles. He said he felt like he was running away from murder. Texas Ranger Captain Manuel Gonzalez said his testimony had very little basis in fact. He was discharged from Camp Shelby, Mississippi in 1945 because he suffered from psychosis. However, Bauman couldn't account for his time in the Texarkana area or secure an alibi. There's also Henry Booker Duty Tennyson, an 18-year-old university freshman who took his own life on November 4th, 1948, and left behind a suicide note in which he confessed to the killing of Paul Martin, Betty Jo Booker, and Virgil Starks, and the attempted murder of Katie Starks. He played trombone in the same high school band as Betty Jo, but they weren't friends. Investigators were unable to find any other evidence linking him to the murders, and a friend of his, James Freeman, provided an alibi for the night of the Starks' murder. However, Dr. John Tennyson, Duty's first cousin once removed, thinks that though the public ruled him out as a suspect, he's more likely to be the killer than Yule Swinney. According to Dr. Tennyson, Duty's suicide note read, Why did I take my own life? Well, when you have committed two double murders, you would too. Yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin in the city park that night and killed Mr. Starks and tried to get Mrs. Starks. Duty referred to four of the five victims by name and mentioned a double murder, alluding that he killed the other two as well. He also wrote about being a burden to his family. He described himself as a social outcast, which, as far as Dr. Tennyson is concerned, is a probable reason for attacking the most common type of people the Phantom did. Older guys dating younger girls. Apparently, Duty had a turbulent relationship with his own father, and it's possible the victims were symbols of someone he felt had wronged him. Here we are, 77 years after the brutal murders of five people and the attack on three others, and we still don't know who did it or why. At this point, most of their family members have probably passed away, never getting answers. By 1948, authorities no longer thought that the Starks murder was connected to the two previous double murders. Which is honestly worse, because that means there were at least two killers in Texarkana at the time. My gut tells me Yule was responsible for the deaths of Richard Griffin, Polly Ann Moore, Paul Martin, and Betty Jo Booker, because his wife Peggy gave so many detailed statements that only someone at the scene would know. But why would Duty confess to the murders in a suicide note if he was innocent? What are your thoughts? I I mean, I agree. Like, Yule seems like the most probable. And Mm -hmm. why do people confess to things that they haven't done? Uh, Maybe it was a way... I honestly tried to look that up. (laughs) (laughs) Why do people do that? Well, maybe it was a way that he... Maybe he felt like confessing to this is a way that he would be remembered, albeit in a bad light, but remembered regardless. Like, they wouldn't forget him because of what he had done. Mm -hmm. I just... Or maybe he was trying to justify him taking his own life, being like, well, I did these horrible things and that's my justification for it. Possibly. Um, But he also confessed to the murders of 
two different sets of people that the police say weren't connected. So, and I, it doesn't police, seem like they were. The police had a lot, a lot of questions and very few answers. So it's easy for people to fill in those answers in whatever way it fits their agenda. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm leaning with the general consensus that it was probably Yule Swinney and there just wasn't enough evidence to actually pin it on him. And because he and Peggy were married and she didn't testify against him, they really had no statements mm-hmm. to work in their favor. Yep. Unfortunately, is kind of my thoughts on it. If only they had the well, crime skeleton to conf- confess their sins to. Oh my god. You're so that definitely would have scared it out of him. Forget truth serum. Just give him the crime skeleton. Exactly. And all your problems would have been solved. That's a really good point. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking a step back in time with us this week for another Texas Unsolved episode. If there's an unsolved Texas case that you would like us to cover, let us know by messaging us on Instagram or emailing us at weirdtruecrime at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Weird True Crime or join the Facebook group. All of the social links can be found in the show notes. It is the season of giving, so if you love what we're doing here in our creepy corner, please share the podcast with a friend or two. This show wouldn't be as fun without your support. I know. We we love you all for it. And until next time, stay safe. And make good choices. Bye. Bye. Texas Ranger, Captain Manuel Manuel. I know that word. Why couldn't I say it? Texas Ranger, Captain Manuel. I did it. Did I do it right? (laughs) It's like one of those words that you know, but then you say it. You're like, that doesn't feel right. You keep trying to say manual. I do. (laughs) Even though you are correct. It's a basic name. It's Manuel. You are right. Just stop trying to go (laughs) manual. (laughs) Cheetah is broken. I am broken. It's the day quill. Okay. <laughs>